Hello, I'm Tony McMahon and this is History's Terrorists. Now, you may have seen me on documentaries on TV about history and science where I'm a, a regular contributor, but welcome to my study here in South London. And what I'm going to be talking to you about actually relates to something else that I do in my life, which is that I'm a communications consultant for governments and big organisations around counter-extremism and counter-terrorism. And it's an area of work, of course, that I find fascinating. Now, back in the early 1980s, I was something of a radical hothead myself. I was a Marxist-Leninist, I suppose, but I never endorsed terrorism, just to be clear on that. But I do understand the kind of process of radicalization and the way in which terrorists' minds work. So what I'm going to do in History of Terrorists is I'm going to go back and look at some of the people and organisations in the past that we may not have regarded as terrorists, but I would argue that they were terrorists. And in that context, we have to ask ourselves, whose side would we have been on, the authorities or these rebels? Remember, remember the 5th of November, gunpowder, treason and plot. Now, this is a rhyme. Uh, that used to be recited by children even when I was young and it refers to a terrorist plot 400 years ago and one of the plotters, Guy Fawkes, is still burnt in effigy today and the plot tried to blow up the king and all his ministers in parliament and the Guy Fawkes mask has become a rather kind of iconic emblem of rebellion and anarchy among some young people in recent years. In fact, I was in Trafalgar Square a few years ago when I saw a demonstration at night, very ominous, where everybody had those Guy Fawkes masks on. So for those of you who may not know the story, we're going back to 1605 and an audacious plot to blow up the king and all his ministers, the entire government, while they were sitting in Parliament. And it's a plot that's kind of divided opinion uh, ever since. I mean, obviously, most people don't condone terrorism, but there was a kind of religious flavour to all of this. So some people think that there was a degree of justification in what the plotters did, and a lot of people think absolutely there was not. Every year still in the town of Lewis in, in southern England, November the 5th is marked with a very fiery display and it involves the demonisation of Guy Fawkes, but also the Catholics who supported Guy Fawkes. And I'll come on to what was going on in 1605 between Catholics and Protestants. You have to go back over the previous 70 years and the Tudor dynasty that had been in power. Henry VIII, you know, him of the six wives, had broken from Rome. In other words, the Pope's writ would no longer run in England and Henry declared himself head of the church in England. He created the Church of England, but he wouldn't embrace full-blown Lutheranism. So he didn't become a kind of full-blown Protestant. He, as it were, nationalised the Catholic Church in England. His son, however, the young Edward VI, uh, did embrace a more full-blooded Protestantism. Now, he died very young. His sister came to the throne, Mary, and she tried to reverse everything back to the Catholic Church. She was a Roman Catholic to her core. She then dies after five years and her sister becomes queen. And that is, of course, Elizabeth I, who has a very long reign. She takes a position similar to her father. And that is a kind of moderate Protestantism with herself as head of the church, but resolutely opposed to the Pope having any say in England. When I say moderate, though, uh, we have to take on board that Catholic priests who were found, particularly if they were found practising mass, will be hanged, drawn and quartered in public, a very grim form of punishment that we'll come to a little later. Uh, and also those who didn't turn up to church services in the new Church of England churches would be fined. They were referred to as recusants. And the families of most of the gunpowder plotters were recusants. 
Now, there was a lot of kind of paranoia about plots from Spain, from the Pope and so on, uh, under Elizabeth I. And she had a very effective spy network that was headed up by Lord Cecil. But she dies. And coming to the throne is James VI of Scotland, because Elizabeth doesn't have any children. She's died childless. She never married. Now, James is the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who was a Catholic, and his wife, Anne of Denmark, is a Catholic. So many English Catholics are very optimistic as they see James VI processing through England to be crowned as James I of England, they become very optimistic that their lives are about to change, that James is going to make things better for Catholics. But James is a wily Scottish pragmatist. Um, sure, he'd like things to be better for uh, Catholics in England, and he is secretly negotiating with the Pope and with Spain. But he's also talking to Lord Cecil, who's been Elizabeth's principal secretary of state and spymaster, and he is no friend of Catholics. So what James is doing is steering a very careful middle path between Catholics and Protestants across Europe in order to secure the English throne for himself. That is the number one aim. As it became obvious that James wasn't going to give English Catholics what they wanted, that he was going to retain the Church of England and even the fines for not attending church, they became increasingly angry. And so the plots started. And there were two plots in particular. The main plot was what one of them was called and the by plot. Now, one plot involved kidnapping the king and forcing him to do what Catholics wanted. The other was to depose James, probably to kill him, and to put in his place his cousin, Lady Arabella Stuart. Now, both these plots were foiled. And in fact, the plot to put Arabella Stuart on the throne involved the arrest of Sir Walter Raleigh. Now, whether he was really involved or not is still a matter of, uh, of debate, but he eventually ended up being executed for his role or his alleged role in that plot. And you'll remember Walter Raleigh, I hope, as being the kind of adventurer, explorer, discoverer, who allegedly brought potatoes and tobacco back to Britain from the New World. As Catholic disappointment increased with James I, a plot was hatched to blow up Parliament when it met. Now, Parliament didn't meet as often as it does today, and it met very much at the behest of the king. But everybody knew that Parliament was going to meet fairly soon. So a plotter called Robert Catesby decided to bring together a group of like-minded people to blow up Parliament. All hope that they had that Spain would help them out or that the king would see sense, all that had gone. They were now desperate men intent on desperate measures. One of the men that Catesby recruited to his plot was Guy Fawkes, who preferred to be known as Guido. Now, Guy Fawkes was essentially a mercenary who had fought for the Spanish in Europe, in the Spanish Netherlands. Uh, and he was an ultra Catholic. He despised the king. He was also a man of military flair and frankly, violence. Aside from Robert Catesby and Guy Fawkes, the other plotters were Thomas Bates, Robert and Thomas Winter, Thomas Percy, Christopher and John Wright, Francis Tresham, Everard Digby, Ambrose Rookwood, Robert Keyes, Hugh Owen, and John Grant. Now, this was going to be terrorism 17th century style. Essentially, many of these plotters were gentlemen. Uh, they were even known to the king and to the court. The target of their operations was the Houses of Parliament, which doesn't look like the compact building that it is today. It was a kind of higgledy-piggledy collection of medieval buildings going back centuries. And incredibly, it was possible to rent space in storage tunnels right underneath the House of Lords. And that's what the plotters went and did. 
As I say, in those days, Parliament met a lot more infrequently, but eventually it was decided that Parliament would meet on the 5th of November 1605. So the plotters ha had a date to work to. And then things went horribly wrong. A letter was sent to Lord Monteagle, who was due to be sitting in Parliament alongside the King that day. Now, the letter, which was purportedly from a family member involved in the plot, possibly Francis Thresham, who was his brother-in-law, basically said, don't turn up in Parliament that day. Make an excuse because something just might happen. Now, Monteagle, ignoring the family link of the person who'd sent in the letter, took it straight to the King and to Lord Cecil. Look what I've got. There's a plot and it's against your life. Now, this exposed the existence of the plot, but some have been rather sceptical about the origin of this letter over the years. Maybe it was sent by Francis Thresham, who was Monteagle's brother-in-law or another of the plotters. But equally, it may have actually come from the pen of Lord Cecil himself, that Cecil knew about the plot, so he created this letter which revealed it. His spies had already found out who was involved. Or some believe that Monteagle himself, in order to curry favour with the king, authored the letter. Now, how would he have been able to do that? Well, basically, he found out bits and pieces about the plot and he basically put it together in that letter. The letter, by the way, is still in the National Archives today, should you ever wish to go and have a look at it. The plotters somehow got wind that now their conspiracy was public knowledge within the court. They discovered the letter that had been sent. So who knows what conversations went on then. But Catesby decides to continue with the plot regardless. I mean, it seems pretty reckless, but these were men who were clearly desperate. In what seems like an almost comical incident, Guy Fawkes was down in the cellars to check on the explosives and ran straight into the Lord Chamberlain, accompanied by Monteagle. And they were having a look around to see if there was anything suspicious. They both saw a big pile of brushwood and bundles of sticks which were hiding the kegs of gunpowder. But they were fobbed off by Guy Fawkes with an excuse that this was just uh, stuff being stored by the cellar's tenant, who he named as Thomas Percy. Guy Fawkes had given a false name for himself, but he'd named Thomas Percy. Now, overnight, Montego, we are told, had a light bulb moment when he thought, hang on a moment, Thomas Percy's got a big property in London. Why does he need to hire sellers? Oh, hang on a moment. And suddenly realised, uh, so we're told, that the gunpowder was under Parliament. And so officers of the Crown went back and they found Guy Fawkes red-handed. With Guy Fawkes now captured and kept in the Tower of London, the other plotters, led by Catesby, fled London. They fled up north where they thought that they would find support to carry on with their planned uprising against the king. But doors were slammed in their faces, even by friends. Everybody knew the game was up, and the only way this was going to end was with Catesby and his fellow plotters being brutally executed in public. They eventually holed up in Holbeach House in Staffordshire, preparing for a shootout. In a rather bizarre turn of events, they decided to dry out some gunpowder uh, in front of the fire. Uh, clearly, with Guy Fawkes not around, they had no idea about the properties of gunpowder. Anyway, it blew up. One of the plotters uh, was blinded and Catesby and another were severely injured. So by the time they did have their shootout with government troops, they weren't exactly in tip-top physical condition. When the shootout did happen, Catesby, uh, Thomas Percy and two of the other plotters were killed during the shootout, probably a mercy to them for what the others were going to endure. Winter, Rookwood, Grant, Digby and Thresham all joined Guy Fawkes in the Tower of London, who had already been tortured severely for information. In fact, the signature of Guy Fawkes on his confession was incredibly shaky, and it really shows 
what he had been put through, one doesn't want to think. The surviving plotters were put on trial for treason. Now, treason trials in the 17th century, uh, well, you could pretty much guess what the verdict was going to be from the beginning. They were also put on trial with a Jesuit priest called Father Henry Garnet, and he would be executed as well as them. So what was the form of execution that was so terrible? Well, it was something called hanging, drawing and quartering. Basically, the plotters were to be dragged on hurdles to the place of execution. They would then be hanged until they were half dead. They would then be cut down. They would be cut open by the executioner, their intestines taken out. They'd be castrated. Eventually, their heart would be taken out. And then after that, they'd be chopped up and different parts of their body would be displayed in different parts of the kingdom. This was as an example to everybody else, do not rebel. The heads normally ended up on spikes somewhere very public, like London Bridge, or in this case, above Parliament. Francis Thresham died in the Tower of London of, we're told, natural causes. The other plotters for this grim form of execution were divided into two groups. One uh, were put through the ordeal in the churchyard of St Paul's Cathedral and the others uh, were executed in front of the Palace of Westminster, which they had attempted, after all, to blow up. Deciding that he'd rather not be eviscerated while still alive, Guy Fawkes apparently jumped from the scaffold while he had the rope around his neck and managed to break his neck. Sensible man. James I ordered all churches by legislation to celebrate the quashing of this plot uh, every year. And it was this, this uh, suppression of terrorism was celebrated in churches for something like 200 years. As for Catholics, they came to be seen as the kind of enemy within. Every Catholic was a potential terrorist in the pay of Rome or in the pay of Spain. From now on, patriotism equaled Protestantism. And over time, Guy Fawkes came to be burned in effigy. Whether or not James I intended that is, is uh, certainly debatable. And this became a ritual forever after. And plus the fireworks, of course, which uh, again are a rather kind of inappropriate uh, celebration of the suppression of a terrorist plot. Even in my lifetime, the resonance of Guy Fawkes Night has kind of diminished, certainly the meaning behind it. And the kind of anti-Catholicism that was still uh, very prevalent in Britain throughout the 19th century and even into the 20th century, that has thankfully diminished as well. Plus, we have that American import Halloween, which has kind of begun to overshadow Guy Fawkes Night in recent years. And let's face it, burning a British terrorist every year is kind of tasteless. I mean, just imagine if Americans burnt Osama bin Laden in effigy every year. Anyway, that's the extraordinary story of a terrorist incident in 1605. I mean, I think it is beyond doubt a terrorist incident, but you tell me what you think. Maybe you think the gunpowder plotters were heroic figures. Do tell me. But whatever, remember, remember on the 5th of November, an incident of terrorism in 1605. Well, that's all for now. Thank you for joining me here in my study and goodbye until we meet again. Oh, <laughs>